welcome back to the second part of an interesting day. I hope you enjoyed lunch. We continue here uh, with a panel, and we continue to talk about cooperation and about partnership. In this panel, we specifically will talk about how partnerships can be shaped between NGOs, governments, economy, and society. On this panel with me, I have Peter Wufri, he's the founder and the president of the Board of Trustees of ELEA Foundation. And the mission of the ELEA, ELEA Foundation is in one short statement to create impact through entrepreneurship. With me is as well Philipp Rösler. Welcome, the CEO of Hainan Young Charity Foundation. That's a global empowerment initiative that does support especially education, entrepreneurship and health. On the panel is also Michael Gerber. We heard Michael Gerber before with his interesting speech, the Special Envoy for Global Sustainable Development Goals 2030. And also on the panel is Hannah Schmid before with an impressive speech of the project. He's the founder of, of Smiling Gecko. Peter Wolfi, I would like to start with you. As an ex CEO of UBS, you could have just enjoyed life. Lean back and just enjoy your wealth. Who says I don't enjoy it? No, I do, no, <laughs> but, but actually you decided to do something. You decided, you decided to be part of the change. Why? Why? Is, it, is, it, is it a calling for you? First, I'd like to thank Hannes for this terrific initiative and for your inspiring speech. And I must say, it's a bit humbling to speak after you, uh, having been just a normal banker, and I don't even know whether I was as good as Sergio Emotti. So That's why we had the lunch break the, in between. So you don't have to speak especially after him, right after him. Well, on a serious note, our foundation is called Essex in Globalization. And if you're born in Switzerland, if you have the privilege to do a career as I have had, and you just uh, can't help but think Think of the two billion people, two and a half billion people who live on daily income below two dollars. And so our mission, as you mentioned it, the mission of the foundation is uh, to essentially uh, fight poverty, absolute poverty, meaning below two dollars uh, a day with entrepreneurial means. Why did I do that? Because I felt uh, it's an ethic necessity. I also felt uh, we had all this terribly emotional dialogue on that bankers make too much money. Uh, and maybe people were right, but there are many people who have too, too much money, right? Some got it from their families, some won in the lottery. I thought the dialogue on what you actually do with the money is much more productive. And I really felt beyond paying tax in a high tax community in Zurich, uh, it's probably a good idea to share some of it with those uh, who actually are in poverty, as we have seen this morning. The second reason was I was young, I was 44, and I uh, already uh, knew then that CEOs uh, kind of live uh, on five to seven years. So the question is, what do you do afterwards uh, uh, if you live up until 90? So for, my, for me, it was also a question of, of, of kind of life, uh, what, what do you do with your life? And so I you feel it incredibly uh, enriching uh, to help fight poverty. If you're an economist, I think that's a that's a duty of economists. Uh, Does it work? Poverty. Does it work to fight poverty for so entrepreneurship? Well, you heard Sihan before, and uh, Sihan, forgive me maybe for telling a few secrets uh, about you, but we work with Sihan since five years. He is one of our 18 social entrepreneurs. And we work in what in venture uh, capital is called the, the valley of death. You know, when an entrepreneur has these startup ideas, there's a lot of hype around it. People love it. They do photos, they do films, they hype the entrepreneurs, and they sometimes tend to forget that then there is a period of five to seven years which is really, really hard work to make something work. And it needs professionalism, it needs dedication, it needs advice, and so we work with Sihan, uh, and I think Sihan uh, becomes investable for impact investors in two, three years, maybe, and unfortunately for the social sector, I mean, if Sihan would be a blockchain entrepreneur, he would have to write a white paper and he could raise an initial coin offering $3 million, right? Unfortunately, the social sector does not have a premium, it has a discount, and so he cannot yet raise $3 million. He needs to prove that he can make money, and we help him on the way, so that's why we are philanthropic impact investors. Philanthropic impact investors, Mr. Rösler, you also, with your charity help, it's a little bit of a different approach at the moment. You are focusing on refugees. Mm -hmm. One third of people do live in refugee camps. 
you are especially active in, in countries like Jordania and Lebanon, where you have to have a very close cooperation with the government. You also build it up this foundation basically from the scratch. What, what was the biggest challenge? I think it's still the biggest challenge to <clears throat> further build up the foundation. But what you mentioned, I think you need, particularly if you work in the humanitarian work with refugees, you need the support, you need the cooperation with the public sector. Be it either the governments in the regions, quite crucial, or international organizations, particularly the UN, which is certainly, as a multilateral organization, a public entity as well. So that's the biggest challenge, to get in touch with them, to understand them, to make sure that you have very good interest for benefit of their people in the region. And when you talk about partnership with, with governments, I mean, where you work now with the big refugee camps in Lebanon, the government has to act. They have to do something. So does that help when the government sees a clear need that they need solutions? Are NGOs more welcome? Now, first of all, so there's a huge difference between the perception of the refugee crisis in Europe, and I'm coming from Germany, so, so, and, and the numbers we are seeing in the Levante, so Jordan, Lebanon, or even Turkey. So they have to deal with much more people, bigger chunk in their society. And the government is well aware of the challenges. And they changed in the last years the approach for the refugee aid. They said, look, it's not the right way to only focus on refugees, because then you create some tension in between your own society because people are saying, oh, refugees are getting more than our ordinary people. So the idea is now to lift the entire society in the region by improving the economy, the educational situation, but this is a different scale, certainly, and um, they need some support desperately to really lift the entire society and not only focusing on refugees. Where do you come in? Where does your foundation come in? You say you focus on entrepreneurship and health. So if you start with education, then entrepreneurship and health. So we learned from the governments, particularly in Jordan, that they don't need any additional schools. They don't need the hardware. They even more need the software. They need teachers. So there's the idea maybe to have some kind of cooperation to take out some of the young students, to train them as trainers, as teachers, as coaches. So that's the idea, and that's what we learned from the government in Jordan. Based on their day-to-day -day experience, they could gain in all the refugee camps as well as in the urban environment. Mm -hmm. In terms of entrepreneurship, so we have one of the biggest refugee camps, and the IKEA Foundation was quite engaged with the photovoltaic, and now they have electricity. Based on electricity, they first can start now some small businesses. They need, by the way, some, some impact investment in terms of microcredits. And, but what they need, and therefore you need again the government, is access to the market for these young mini-entrepreneurs. And that's a discussion we are talking about, to get first the financing in terms of microfinance, microcredits, but then to give them access, as well as all the other entrepreneurs as well, to the market. And that's the way I think entrepreneurship can lift the entire society and not only focusing on refugees. Because basically what we said, what the, what the panel is about, it's a partnership between all these actors, all these players. You need the investment, but then you do, especially in what you're focusing on at the moment, you need a strong cooperation with the institutions, with the government. So it's a, it's a whole chain. Talking about the partnership with government, Hannes Schmid, that's also a big issue for you. I mean, we heard it before in your speech, you need the investment. You've been so far quite successful in that, involving a lot of uh, Swiss companies. But you also do need the cooperation of the government in a certain way. How difficult is this in Cambodia and how you work your way around it? Well, Cambodia is a different game, but I think first I'm looking for the support of the Swiss government. And, uh, well, I tried and then I start to realize that uh, I probably would have to increase my overheads by several hundred percent just to fulfill my applications I have to do. And then I fulfill this. I need two, three people who study these uh, papers. And then it gets handed in uh, to you know, our government. And then there's a group of people studying it. And uh, I would doubt that they have even an understanding what they study because they really don't have the experience where I come from. And then they have another expert, this group, and then they come back and then they have to tell me that I have to run the business. So, I mean, we are actually till about what, three months ago, we were two people in my organization in Switzerland. Now we are three, right? But I think I would have to increase, increase to about five or six 
just to fulfill the paperwork. So that means I suddenly would have like 35, 40%, 50% overhead uh, just to do my business. And I think this is also a kind of a, a thing. Uh, of course, then it's very expensive in Switzerland to have your overheads. I mean, you cannot find somebody for 20,000 bucks uh, as a secretary, you know, it costs 60, 70, 80,000. I learned very quickly that I move everything was admin to Cambodia. So we facilitate from here, we do our, the ideas, we're looking for the money, we do our PR we do here, but keep it very, very slow, low, and everything else, accounting, uh, marketing, everything, it's down there. And uh, so this is how we actually survived with very low uh, overheads. But it doesn't mean that you're a good NGO if you have only low overheads, because uh, you can see if you're going to venture out, if you have to do advertisement, it always depends how much money you make. When you make one million, you can spend 100,000 if you have your uh, cap on, on 10%. When you make 10 millions, you have one million to spend. So, but to increase from one million to 10 million, you have to do, you have to invest. So I prefer to invest the money I have in my activities and dealing with the private industry than investing it in the administration I have to do from the government. So that's what it is. In Cambodia, it's a different game. For me, the government is not existing. Um, I have, uh, I'm, you know, I, I grew up as a, as a goat, Peter. I'm born 1946 in the Tokenburg. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, my father, I was with the goats till uh, 53. Every summer I heard them. And my father always said, Hannes, this is the best education you can get. If you know how to handle your goat, you can handle your life. <laughs> so I came to Cambodia and I started to realize that it's the, prime, the president has lots in common with my goats. So I think I know how to handle the president. Because, you know, both want the same thing. The ones, the goats, they want to eat grass and the other one wants to eat money. So they're actually reflecting on the same way. So I try to stay away from it as much as I can. I'm not commenting on that, but I'm sure Michael Gerber, Michael Gerber would. Because you just, you, you, you said yes. It's exactly, uh, the goat example is true. Why so? Well, I think it was a school for his life, and uh, he, he's proven that um, he knows how to manage people and, uh, and the way around government. <laughs> so, but I think, you know, the big dilemma with governments is that um, we are or must be accountable to, to taxpayers and um, to the parliament. And therefore, we set up a bureaucracy, you know, um, having to do proper procurement and then, you know, planning, monitoring, ev evaluations of projects, etc., which is for an organization uh, such as yours, of course, a big effort to handle with. And I can fully understand, <coughs> I think, if you have partners uh, such as the ones you have on board, I think it's a much more straightforward way to work. And I can fully understand that you have to work around government also in Cambodia. We have our own experiences there. Um, but usually, you know, NGOs, um, you are not a, a common NGO. So you were on the spot and then you decided to, you know, find kind of a structure to get organized. But uh, usually NGOs are organized the way they can provide governments with what they need in terms of bureaucracy and proper, um, you know, paperwork. <laughs> to follow up on projects, that's, uh, that's a big but, issue, I yeah, see. But, but for me, the problem is the chain goes on. So the government gives money to a halfway funded organization, you know, and then this organization still is not having really a project. Then they delegate it to the next organization. So at the end, you have a whole chain till then you really reach the ground, the field work, right? That is actually not much left of the money who actually have been first uh, given to it. And I think this is a problem we have to take in consideration. Uh, it's the same. Uh, I, I, I get from um, a very big bank, I get a certain amount, right? And uh, this amount is dedicated for people we educate. And then when I look at the paper from $100,000, I spend $55,000 just to fulfill their needs, right? And I send it back and I say, thank you very much. <laughs> because from the $100,000, at least $90,000 
should go into the project. But I think, Hannes, we, we are in the bridge building business, right? Yeah. I think we should not uh, cultivate this antagonism because at the end, yeah. I think you yeah. need big business, you need civil society, and you need government. And my experience has unfortunately maybe not been with the Swiss government so far, but with Deutsche Entwicklungshilfe, where we have made two projects where they essentially matched uh, what we gave. Uh, and yes, it cost a bit of time, yes, it cost a bit of forms, but we could mobilize more capital. And we saw that the Deutsche Entwicklungshilfe clearly uh, has been very favorable to entrepreneurship. Uh, and so I think government is also learning. I think what I missed and what I tried to express this morning with my question is I would I miss a bit that government is not focusing on what it is really good at, which is essentially governance. Uh, I think it would really be good if government would help other countries uh, to get better governed uh, rather than com compete with the private sector. Uh, it would be so helpful, for example, if government would came, come up with a creative solution on what you do with all those aging dictators, right? Maybe what world community could buy an island, build a great resort, <laughs> send them there, In Dubai, protect they them to. from <laughs> prosecution, and they could make room for their successes without being prosecuted, uh, and so they would not have to hang on their job simply because they want to stay alive. And I think this is probably one of the biggest governance problems uh, that, that hinders people like Hannes and ourselves in our work, and I think that is something that we cannot solve. Mm -hmm. This is something the world government leaders have to solve. So but you're saying it needs, it needs strong institutions, right? Point 16 or the SD, SDG goals. But then again, Mr. Gerber, you also said this morning, that was exactly the point that was, that was really f fight it over. Because many, of course, many countries didn't want this on the list of the SD, SDG mm -hmm. uh, 2030. So how could you got it on it? Well, first comment on, on, on the model you, you just mentioned um, in terms of partnership with uh, public-private uh, sector. Um, I think that's another model. Um, usually if we fund an NGO just, you know, with grants, um, it is another story. So you have to do all this paperwork and be accountable. But if you engage together in a, in a PPP, it's a different story. Then you really have complementary uh, competencies which you bring into a project. And I think, yeah, one can profit from the other uh, approach. And you can, as I mentioned this morning, all the examples I showed were actually public-private partnerships. And then you can really address systemic uh, barriers as well in, in place in other countries. Uh, you have the, the government on your side who is dealing with the local government, etc., which has an experience in, in that field. However, uh, the second part of what you mentioned is indeed the tricky thing. Um, Switzerland has been active for many, many years, decades, in the field of, of good governance. And of course, I think we also um, have some tangible results in that field. But still, um, then you have a, a changing government and you start from scratch. Or in fragile countries um, where institutions are terribly weak, you have to build them up. It takes decades usually. It took decades in Switzerland too to build up these institutions uh, the way we have it today, that quality. Um, so it is a real, real big issue and problem but uh, in which we are also engaged. But uh, the other side of the story is that you, you can't communicate the same way as we can in, 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 the, in the case of, of such a good um, project that uh, Hannes has presented this morning in the field of governance to show results and make them understandable to the public, etc., is much, much more difficult. If you build on up institutions and you have to show how they work, etc., it's not very attractive also to yeah. listen to. Well, I like to say there's also a big change of the games, uh, especially in Asia. Uh, Cambodia, uh, well, the president is just electing himself. Right? And he said he's got a state in 26, and then in 2032, he's the president in 85. And uh, the Americans said, no, you cannot do that. I mean, we want to monitor, you know, the elections. And if you go like this, uh, we're going to cut your funds, the same as with the Europeans. Well, they cut their funds, and he said, you know what? I have the Chinese. They don't care. Right? So they signed 27 contracts, a couple of billion dollars. So the Chinese is buying the Cambodians so that they can put in the veto into the Asian area. So th this is, you know, as I said, so I understand it's very difficult from our side, our uh, uh, political understanding, then we want to put them under pressure. 
but then they get just filled in either by the Russian or by the Chinese, you know. So this is also something, I mean, I don't know how, how strong the Chinese are involved in, in uh, these uh, so, things. So being in between, you also, t we talked about it already before, being in between this, um, the, the investment and the government, and you mentioned before when we talked that the reg that it should be done that the regulators are invited and actually regulators would define what kind of aid, what kind of investment they would allow. And before there is no definition, it's really, really difficult to actually act and that is acting that has an impact. Yeah, so we started the discussion about impact and we said, look, maybe it's the highest level of impact is some kind of cultural change, behavioral change or even system change. But in order to do so, I'm really convinced that you do need the private sector, the civil society, but also the public sector. And the specific question was, if we talk about impact investment for foundations, mm -hmm. there are some legal frameworks which are very good in Switzerland, for example. So you allow it as a foundation, tax exempt. However, you allow it to make some impact investment. If you're a foundation, for example, in Germany, beautiful country, but unfortunately, foundations, tax exempt, are yet not allowed to do all the different instruments, to all different <clears throat> instruments to, to have these fancy innovations in terms of blended finance, impact investment, and so forth. Maybe the easiest way would be, and that would my plea if you would like to have a change, to bring them together to talk about, to explain what you need as a private sector or as a civil society in order to have some impact benefiting the people, and then to explain what would be nice change of the legal framework. So that's not super naive. I do know that's a long way, but I think it's worth to give it a try. So very concretely, how would you bring them together? So for example... It has, been, it has been said many times today. We talk about partnership and cooperation all day. How would that look like very concretely? So I'm certainly biased because, as you may know, so I worked before I joined the Sihang Foundation, four years in the management board of the World Economic Forum, Swiss institution. And so, and that's the idea inspired by Professor Schwab as a multi-stakeholder gathering. So the meeting in Davos is not a meeting of the business guys, but it's really multi-stakeholder community. Business, government, civil society, academics, the youth, media. And the idea is really to bring them together. And the last three annual meetings in Davos they spoke about, back in times we spoke about, about the change of the humanitarian work, of the innovations, always together with the Queen of Jordan, for example, with some businessmen, Hamdi Ulukaya, and others, really to talk about changed approach, what does it mean for the legal framework, and what is the business role to play in order to fill then this legal framework. I think that was very fruitful, and today's meeting here as well, is to some extent a similar gathering, only missing, full of respect certainly for the foreign minister of Liechtenstein, but maybe some additional politicians to talk about and to, to nail them down. I totally understand that you don't want to work together with the prime minister in, in, in Cambodia, so and uh, he has a certain <laughs> reputation, let me say in this words, very neutral, as this Liechtenstein ground. But at the end, but there is a risk, and that's not trivial. There's a risk that if he sees your activity is a threat. You can be sure that he will stop your engagement. And we have seen it several times, and they are not shying away even to, to fight against the Catholic Church or others. So, you know, I'm looking Asian, so I was born in Vietnam, so coming off a Catholic orphanage, and once, even when I was, a, you know, in Germany, a politician, so I handed over once a list for, for, for political prisoners, as well as for these Orphanage. But, you know, the government says, look, this is ours and we're not friends of the Catholic Church and they do the stuff. So you need some kind of neutral ground and it's maybe our job to create this kind of neutral ground where they come together. And yes, if you see them and you have certainly by heart, even I'm not any more active politician, but you still... <laughs> so, but then you have to put it away and say, look, yeah, now we have to deal with them. So if you would like to change it, then you can go back into politics, which is not my goal. Yes. Publicly, but 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 I think you have to to bring them together, yeah. like it or, or like them or not. I think that is well, really right. crucial. Yeah. Otherwise, there's a you, you you leave a gap with a huge risk. Oh, I, mean, I you know I I, mean, I, I, I think bringing people together is one idea, but the other is also to be a bit more realistic about the current impact investment hype, you know, because when you look to the uh, kind of proposals, it is very easy to make money and do well. 
our experience is, particularly if you talk with social impact, I mean, obviously, if you put money into solar uh, power plants, then it's easy to make money. But if you fight poverty act actively in the way that uh, Hannes does it and that we do it, it's actually very tough to make money. Mm -hmm. And I think I would argue that every impact investor should put 10% of his 90% of his 100% into philanthropic impact investing. And I think that's then easier to convince authorities that this should be tax exempt. Because obviously, if it would be so easy to make money, then it's obvious that the tax authorities say, well, why should we tax exempt this? Right. So I think a bit more realism would probably help. Like uh, my experience, I know that I, I have to have a dialogue with the government. But it depends how much do they let them in into my project and not. So I was involved uh, in that group where I um, was together with Hun Sin and his ministers in Davos. So I was very close to him, right? And we had a lunch. And then um, I was sitting beside Hun Sin. And then he said to me, uh, Mr. Schmidt, um, yeah, I think we need your help. I think we, we need the help of the Swiss government. And then I had to say, Your Highness. You know, I said, Your Highness, well, what kind of help you need? He said, I realized we have no professionals in Cambodia. And we need professionals because all these cheap labors, one day we don't gonna need them anymore. And I said, but how can I help? He said, I have an idea. In three years, Cambodia has to become the most advanced country for high technology and IT. <laughs> then I looked at him and said- Three years. Your Highness, uh, tell her your story. Then I told him about my children, uh, you know, uh, they're coming out of nine years of school in 2027 and 2031, 30, day two, they are leaving the stage of having a, a skill. And then maybe we're talking about 2037, 2040, they become professionals. He looked at me and said, why does it take so long? <laughs> so I have a dialogue, but it's exactly what, what you said is right. Uh, if I come in with 50 million bucks, I'm grilled. That's when I get take the money. But they don't want to do the job I do because it grows very slowly, very steadily, it's hard work. They don't even feel it. They're not interested to deal with us. You know? And I have to see that they, in the stage we are now, they leave us alone. But the other hand, they have to fulfill what we talked about this morning, 2030. Cambodia has to sign it. And I said to Shun Santol, to the economic minister, I said, look, just leave me alone. 2025, I'll give you a present. He said, where's the present? I said, look, if you look what you have to fulfill, you know, in 2025, I give you my project, right? And you go to UEN and say, look how good we are Cambodians. <laughs> we have, so then we have somehow, we have to involve them, right? So, but you have to have a dialogue with the government. Di dialogue is important. Um, you also said that Peter Wolfley, it's the hype of impact investment, that it has to be very clear, or people have to be aware of, it's five to seven years of really, really hard work. It's not just a quick money-making machine. But still, sustainable financing, we could say, is the key of it all. I think that's one key, but the other one is to bring finance together with entrepreneurship. And it seems to me that today we have social entrepreneurship. I mean, Sihan just uh, was awarded a Shoka Fellow uh, two weeks ago. We're very proud of it, uh, having uh, worked with him so closely. Uh, but I think an Ashoka Fellowship does not solve the capital gap problem. So, and I think to bring capital together with entrepreneurship uh, is what takes professionals, what takes patience, what takes time, what takes advice. And often, how foundations are set up today, these kind of services are treated as overhead. They're not treated as value creation, uh, which I think is a problem. I think uh, we should rather adopt the thinking that marketing people adopt, which is if you invest one dollar in a sponsoring event, you should adopt and invest another dollar to make the sponsoring event uh, work and be effective. And I think that thinking we miss today. That is why our foundation has 10 professionals to make sure that the capital we invest is actually invested in the right projects, with the right impact, with the right direction, and with the right results. We, it needs capital, it needs, uh, it needs also big companies realizing that they can also gain something. But this whole CSR, corporate social responsibility, I mean, today it really seems to be the new currency. Everybody has to do it. Your share is basically not, has not as much value if you don't do it. Is it really that companies already realized that being, let's say, ecological is also being economical, or is it more still a PR thing, that they just know we have to do it? I think it, I think it used to be a PR thing 10 years ago. I think mm -hmm. it's no longer. I think the big CEOs I know 
they are aware, they take it very seriously. So I think it's not an issue at the CEO level. I think the problem is at the supply, supply chain level, four levels below, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the guy who buys the coffee in Costa Rica uh, or in a Latin American country, he is the guy who needs to have different incentives. And, and, and I think that's where it's really, really tough to make the changes within the organization, within the corporations. We have, I'm, uh, besides being chairman of IDEA, I'm chairman of IND, which is a business school, and we have 8,000 executives coming to our uh, campus in Lausanne every year from 100 countries. And we have set up a chair uh, at the beginning of this year, a day chair for social innovation, to exactly tackle that problem. We want to work at the executive level with the managers on how to, for example, use digitalization to create impact uh, at, at the front line, not at the kind of Davos type level, right? Where it's about great slogans and about great statements, but at the, at the grassroots level where it's about changing behaviors uh, at the front line. Changing behaviors at the front line and uh, creating partnerships, corporations. Unfortunately, we are already at the end, the time is over. It was blinking here red. Do you see it? It looked very scary. I think we really, we rather, we do have to stop because I still want to open uh, the floor for some questions. Are there any questions in the audience to any of the four gentlemen up here? Yes, please. My name is Andy Kunz, and I'm the founder of uh, the Noiva Foundation. We work in Jordan among Syrian refugees. And I'm involved in a couple of huge um, uh, projects in Jordan and in the West Bank. Uh, ways to energy, we are creating about 1,500 jobs, which is, I think, very important for that area. Humanitarian help, the classic help, it's okay. We need to do that, and we will continue to do that, but we need to create jobs. And there are other projects that uh, in my suitcase, but I need connections, I need help. The question goes to who? Everybody. Anybody who wants to help? Can help. Really? <laughs> you work in Jordania, so Mr. Can, so before I worked at the forum, but now even as well with the Royal Court in Jordan, and as far as I know, they're really interested not only having this humanitarian work, the support for the people, particularly for the refugees, but they really would like to lift, again, the entire economy, which means to have a business environment which is very healthy. So I can bring you in touch with the Royal Court and then to say, look, let's talk about additional projects to the already existing in order to lift the entire economy, to create a healthy framework for all the different entrepreneurs, not only for the refugees. Okay. Directly after the session. Mm. <laughs> I have a question to the right side here. How much public-private partnerships are really existing in Switzerland and, and using best practices in order to achieve the best results? Well, at the level of the national government, I can only speak for international cooperation at this level um, and for SDC in the foreign uh, ministry. There are around 30, 35 public-private partnerships, but you know, quite uh, large-scale uh, projects um, that we have with companies uh, from Switzerland. And Switzerland actually committed, or SDC committed, to double these um, uh, public-private partnerships within four years until 2020. So there's a lot of room for new partnerships uh, that is out there. And uh, I invite all of you, the entrepreneurs, to to use this room and um, make, yeah, make use of it. But of course, there are many other smaller public-private partnerships we have at a local level. We usually, if we work in that field of economic development, we have, of course, the small uh, local businesses on board. So I, I couldn't count them, they're countless. Um, but they are necessary at all, all levels. Um, and I think there is also still room to, uh, for uh, a closer cooperation with foundations, as you mentioned it before. Um, you know, there are different channels and, and at the government of, of Switzerland, we try to, to um, invest more now in new financing instruments and also in social entrepreneurship and also testing uh, new instruments of, of cooperation. That used to be impossible. Uh, you know, we had the classic development um, projects and uh, with all the paperwork <laughs> that you mentioned, Hannes. So this has to change. We are aware of that. 
Mia. Any more questions? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Comment on the role of the different actors in the partnership. I would like to support Mr. Rösler's argument for multi-stakeholder partnerships and a little bit um, contradict uh, Mr. Wuffli, who on the one hand you said we have to be aware of the limits of uh, venture philanthropy in, in solving big problems in health and education and poverty eradication. Um, so I think the role of government needs to go beyond governments uh, because uh, even in a country like Switzerland, uh, the hell, I'm not a Swiss, sorry, um, the government plays a major role in education and health, so how could it realistically be that in a country like Burkina Faso or Ethiopia, this could be just done with impact investment? So, and there are excellent examples, like for example, in the area of neglected tropical diseases where NGOs, governments, private sector work together. And I would also like to stress a role of civil society in keeping governments accountable and uh, supporting the civil society in our partner countries to keep the government sustain, uh, accountable in order that we reach what Mr. Rösler said, cultural change, behavioral change, and finally, uh, system change and without the governments and without the population we cannot reach that this is my opinion well i don't think i said that i don't think oh, i said sorry. that the government should only do governance i think it should also do governance yeah. and maybe do more governance because that's the thing that the government can really do best but of course i mentioned it even myself yeah. in in our work we do work together occasionally yeah. with government and sometimes it works thank you very much so i see the best impact if the different actors work together <laughs> can, I, can I say a few words on the, maybe also a little bit to the defense of um, Mr. Gerber, so Martina Gauss from UBS Optimus Foundation. Um, as you might know, we have started to work into social finance, development impact bonds, really public, uh, an example of public-private partnerships. Um, but what we see is a lack of an actual marketplace. So there are these emerging um, models of single development impact bonds, social impact bonds, public-private partnerships, and um, kind of a missing lead, I would almost call it, um, which cannot come from foundations like ours or from private investors that we might tackle. It has to come from state actors. And what we see is that the structures, on the other hand, on the government side, are not yet ready to really enable these um, finance, financial structures for social finance, for example, that pours more money in a commercial way into these pricing needs. So maybe you can um, elaborate a bit on what you know, SDC, Stateco, and so on are currently um, trying to do in that, way, that aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right, I fully agree. There is need for such platforms, and I think this is an excellent start. Um, to invite people from all different fields in that area to come together and start exchanging and maybe also seeking partnerships and concretize them after uh, you met at such a platform. And we miss, we are lacking platforms such as this. Um, I have to admit the Swiss government is not used to, you know, um, stimulate such discussions, um, at least in the, in the past decades. But I think with the SDGs, we have also a ve vehicle um, that invites many different stakeholders from all over Switzerland and Liechtenstein uh, in included um, to bring these expertise together and work on, on new ways uh, of cooperation and also financing. I think it's an extremely stimulating area of, of cooperation that now with impact investment is, is coming up, is now a trend as well, which uh, we would like to come in but of course, uh, governments um, are slower than the private actors, as usual. And so we have to find uh, and to learn a lot from, from you too. But I agree, and we are working on that. There is a platform on the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs that we established, a dialogue with all interested parties in Switzerland that is uh, actually meeting twice a year or so. And every time we invite, there are more people coming, so it's a good sign, but I agree we have to find new ways and maybe smaller platforms to really get more concrete in, in, in specific fields like financing.
but thank you for the effort. We stay in touch. My name is Roman. I'm co-founder of the Trash Hero Movement. And I have a question um, how to deal, especially in corrupt countries. We're active in Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar. And until now, we simply solved that problem that we said, if people go out and clean every week, you're not supposed and you're not allowed to take a single dollar, just take in-kind donations. We do the same with other projects. But at a certain level, we grow so fast now that at a certain level, we need to involve money. We need to have country managers in those countries. So my question is, in those corrupt countries, what is your best practice or tips and tricks to get government NGOs, economies together and minimize the corruption? Maybe you have a good story from your experience. I know Hannes has a lot of stories, but I think that would be very interesting also for other foundations who support many projects in countries where their corruption is huge. Thank well, you. I can say uh, in Cambodia, corruption has become a part of the culture. And uh, while it starts on the very top, we always say uh, the fish stinks first on the head and then it goes down. And you have to understand, you have to analyze why is there corruption. Um, you have a police officer, his monthly salary is $40. He has two kids, three kids, he cannot survive. So what does he do? He goes on the road, he stops the truck, and he says, like, ah, this, this, this. I need a dollar, right? So that's how he makes his dollar. So when you drive in Cambodia from the countryside, you see there is many kind of policemen, the truck drivers have the money outside already, right? Mm -hmm. So we started, I said, we do not pay any corruption. <laughs> and uh, so we start to realize there's a, there's a very clever way how it's handled. So in our area where we live, uh, of course the policeman, the guy, the politician, the teacher, they all take money. You know, the kids have to pay in the school and everything. And say so they take, before they take, um, well, the guys make maybe a, a dollar a day, so they take like maybe five cents, ten cents, right? Uh, but now he makes two dollars. Now the guy takes 20 cents. So corruption is increasing, but also the teacher cannot survive if he makes 50, 60 dollars. He needs to take the money from the kids. So uh, this is the biggest problem we have. And uh, is, I don't know how to, you're gonna stop it. Um, I, I had quite a number of talks with uh, Shun Santul, the economic minister, and I think Cambodia is fighting to get a place, it would be the ideal place to be a hop. You know, Singapore, very expensive. You get hardly any permits anymore for banks as an expert. Uh, Bangkok is expensive. Hong Kong is even more expensive. Uh, cost of living are quite inexpensive. So it would be a good place for the big corporations. And I talked with AXA, I talked with a couple of big guys. Why don't you move there? This is, is the best place to be, right? They say, well, we have an ethnic commission. We cannot go there. So actually the government is start thinking if they're 80% of the GDP coming out of labor work with the women who do not exist anymore in 15, 20 years because the robots are producing the clothes. Where do are we standing? So I think it's going to be changing so the corruption have to slowly stop from the top down. But this takes generation. At the other hand, when the Chinese now coming in, now you think they're coming in with billions. They're very clever. They get for maybe five to 10,000 bucks, a Chinese gets a citizenship. He moves there with his family. See, kids are not five, six years old. They're already 16, 17, 18. This is the next generation who is will go into the politics. And we're asking ourselves in 15 years, who is making the rules in this country? If you suddenly in the government, you all have Chinese guys. So this is all this situation where you start to discover and this is huge problems and I have no solution how to solve that. No solution so far? Any other inputs? Because the question was how to move in these countries, right? Yes. Well, my experience, you do, but it's difficult. We yes, know from our, experience our experience has been that if you are working on poverty, there is not so much corruption yeah. because there's not, not much money. Like. I think the money is where uh, essentially commodity trades are. It's, it's in the central, in the yeah. cities. It's where the, where the state budget is. And quite frankly, it's where the development aid budgets are. And that's where the corruption is. It's where the money is. I think if you work on rural areas, I mean, uh, Sihan could probably talk more closely about Bagosphere. Uh, I think we were exposed there uh, as well when we were certainly forced uh, to apply for licenses and we just mm. completed with the requirements without paying. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a tough thing because it's in, ingrained in the, in the society. So, yeah. Well, a lot of the NGOs, when they need a permit, 
but they cannot show like corruption in their books. They just engage an agent, of course. Mm. Then you or consulting. Agent. Consulting, and they send Consul you the bill, and then everything is fine in your books. Right? Easy to go. Magic. Oh, that's true even in Washington. To be yeah, I just, I just wanted to say, <laughs> consulting, you cannot just get used to Cambodia. <laughs> exactly. No, but it's difficult to find. You have your standards, right? There's another thing uh, where we implemented immediately, you know, is that we are... <laughs> Like, we have a lot of employees every day, and then Leap and I, we were discussing, and I said, can we bring the Swiss uh, laws, I mean, our work laws? So we started to implement eight hours a day, five days a week, uh, right? We have maternity leaves for the women. We have uh, health insurance, accidents insurance, and now we're starting with the pension fund. So it's actually crazy in a country who doesn't exist, suddenly we as an NGO start to do our own rules and regulations for our workers. But then the question is now, there's a big uh, uh, lawyer's office is, uh, is writing a story about it, they analyze that this is that what is the impact of us doing that? Will it reflect positive into the society or is it going to be negative? You know, so suddenly the other, the Chinese guys in the factories, they don't like us, you know, because suddenly they all run off there and they want to come to us. So this is all these games you, when you start working there, you start to find out, you know, and it is difficult. It's very difficult. And as you said, I think we as an NGO, the way we operate, we are probably on the same risk scale than a startup. It is difficult, you need to find out about the rules of the country, you need um, to find your way around it, and above all, you need to find cooperation and partnerships. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.